This video will provide an overview of how breast cancer is diagnosed and treated. Each female breast is made up of approximately 20 lobes, and each lobe made up of 20 to 40 lobules. During lactation, milk is made within these lobules, and it travels through ducts released at the nipple. Breast tissue is made up of terminal ductal lobular units, or TDLUs, fat and fibrous tissue. The TDLU is the functional unit of the breast. It's composed of multiple acini, which produce milk, and a duct, which transports it. And a closer look at the acini reveals milk within the luminal spaces, which stains pink here. Breast cancer is significantly more common in women than in men, and it typically occurs between the ages of 55 and 64. In 2014, 230,000 women have been diagnosed with breast cancer, and 40,000 have died from it. And one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime. The benefits of self-breast exam for detecting cancer is still unsettled. However, women should be aware of any suspicious changes to their breasts and bring these to a physician's attention. Some of the warning signs of breast cancer include a suspicious lump, swollen lymph nodes around the breast, persistent pain, swelling or redness of the breast, dimpling of the skin or nipple inversion, and discharge of fluid other than breast milk. If warning signs are present, a clinical breast exam will be performed by a medical professional. Even without warning signs, clinical breast exams should begin around age 20 and be done every three years. Women 40 and older should have a clinical breast exam annually. Imaging studies such as mammography is often the next step for women with suspicious findings, and this is called a diagnostic mammography. Screening mammographies are routinely used in an attempt to detect cancers that are not associated with any warning signs at all. The mammogram on the right shows a solid white nodule, and this may represent cancer. Most women will begin screening mammograms around age 40 and every one to two years after that. If imaging confirms that a lesion is suspicious, it must be removed or sampled for a diagnosis to be made. A needle core biopsy removes small needle core samples of a breast lesion. Open biopsies, which are a little more traumatic, can be incisional or excisional. Incisional biopsies remove a portion of the lesion, while excisional biopsies attempt to remove the entire lesion. A biopsy is used to obtain tissue so that a pathologic diagnosis can be made. A lumpectomy is a type of breast conserving surgery that is used to remove a lesion after a diagnosis is already known. A lumpectomy removes a lesion with a small rim of breast tissue surrounding it. Here you can see that a lumpectomy is much larger than a needle core biopsy. With the help of imaging, a wire or radioactive seeds can be placed directly into the lesion. And these are so that the surgeon can better localize the lesion when the lumpectomy procedure is later performed. When the lumpectomy specimen is removed, sutures are placed on it so that the position of the specimen can be known. Each outer surface of the lumpectomy specimen is inked a different color, so that these colored margins can be individually identified and assessed underneath the microscope. Cut surfaces of this lumpectomy reveal a smooth yellow fatty cut tissue, and this is totally normal. However, cut surfaces of this lumpectomy reveal a firm white tissue, and this is cancer. Sometimes a breast conserving surgery like a lumpectomy is not appropriate, like when tumors are large, and a mastectomy must be performed. There are several different types of mastectomies, like a simple mastectomy, which removes the entire breast. There are nipple and skin sparing mastectomies. A modified radical mastectomy removes the breast, lining of the chest wall, and lymph nodes. And a radical mastectomy removes the breast, muscle from the chest wall, and lymph nodes. Radical mastectomies are only necessary if tumors spread directly into the chest wall. Here's a simple mastectomy composed of the entire breast and the nipple areola complex. And here's a skin sparing mastectomy. Mastectomy specimens are also inked multiple colors and they are serially sectioned so the entire specimen can be evaluated. Cancer may have a relatively well-defined boundary as seen here and notice how the inked margins are free of malignancy. Cancer may also have infiltrative or vague boundaries and notice how in this example it's difficult to tell if the cancer extends to that inked margin, so microscopic examination will be necessary. Ductal carcinoma is the most common type of breast cancer, representing 80% of all cases, and ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS, is the precursor to this cancer. DCIS is considered a precancerous or non-invasive cancerous lesion, but it can progress into ductal carcinoma, which is an invasive cancerous lesion. DCIS and ductal carcinomas are graded, with higher grades being associated with worse outcomes. The grading of DCIS is based on cell characteristics, such as cell size, cell variation, the presence of nucleoli, and the presence of dividing cells. A cell is composed of pink cytoplasm, a blue nucleus, and sometimes a nucleolus. Here, cells with pink cytoplasm and blue nuclei are seen, however, nucleoli are not seen. Examining individual cells in DCIS is necessary for grading. In DCIS, the acini are distended with cells, and in low-grade DCIS, the cells are round and appear similar.
In high-grade DCIS, the cells vary considerably from one another. Some cells have nucleoli, some cells have elliptical nuclei, and some cells have these large giant nuclei. DCIS sometimes contains small calcifications, and these are frequently picked up on mammography. Screening mammograms are useful because they can detect DCIS, which will be treated before they become invasive cancers. In normal breast tissue, the acini are confined by basal cells, which are stained brown here. DCIS is also confined by basal cells. Basal cells have flattened nuclei, and sometimes they can be seen without special stains. Cancer cells break through this basal layer and invade the surrounding tissue. The lack of basal cell staining around the tubules on the right is indicative of cancer. Here, breast cancer has destroyed the normal structures of the breast. Invasive ductal carcinoma is graded by the Nottingham system by assessing tubule formation, atypical nuclei, and dividing cells. Grade 1 cancers have numerous tubules made of small round cells with small round nuclei. In grade 3 cancers, there's no tubules, just sheets of large atypical cells with prominent nucleoli and numerous dividing cells. In cases without prominent duct formation, a special stain called ecadherin can be used, which can help confirm the diagnosis. 86% of individuals will survive five years after their diagnosis. Lobular carcinoma is the second most common form of breast cancer, making up 10% of cases, and is characterized by single-file lines of cells infiltrating the breast tissue. These cells are negative for ecadherin. Individuals with lobular carcinoma have survival rates similar to that of ductal carcinoma. Here are some cancers that are considered to have better outcomes than ductal carcinoma. Tubular carcinoma is a reclassification of the ductal carcinoma cases which have the most favorable features. Mucinous carcinoma is composed of tumor cells which float in pools of mucin. In cribriform carcinoma, the tubules are fused to one another. Papillary carcinoma is a well-demarcated cancer with tumor cells surrounding a vascular core of tissue. Medullary carcinoma is a well-demarcated cancer and is composed of atypical cells and lymphocytes. The following are types of cancers with outcomes worse than ductal carcinoma. Metaplastic carcinoma is composed of cells which are not typically seen in the breast, such as these spindle cells seen here. And in this case, squamous cells with abundant pink cytoplasm are seen. Micropapillary carcinoma has clusters of tumor cells surrounded by white empty spaces. Mixed carcinomas have features of both ductal and lobular carcinoma, represented by both tubules and single file lines of cells. The special stain ecadherin highlights the tubule forming portions of the tumor. However, the lobular portion of the tumor does not stain. In phyloides tumor, spindled or elongated cells proliferate and distort the normal architecture of the breast. While most phyloides tumors are benign, cancerous forms can occur depending upon the number of dividing cells in the tumor. In Paget's disease, large clear cells invade the skin of the nipple and areola. Paget's disease is important to recognize because almost all cases are associated with an underlying cancerous or precancerous lesion. And here an invasive cancer can be seen. In inflammatory carcinoma, the lymphatic channels which drain lymph fluid are blocked by tumor cells. Inflammatory carcinoma can often cause red, swollen, and pitted breast skin, and unfortunately this can lead to a misdiagnosis as an infection. Angiosarcoma is a lesion that often occurs several years after having breast radiation therapy and often manifests as a skin rash. Angiosarcoma is composed of cancerous vessels with cells that have large and atypical nuclei. Breast cancer outcomes are dependent on the T&M staging, which is calculated using the size of the tumor, number of lymph nodes with cancer, and the presence of metastatic or distant cancer spread. The type and grade of tumor also have prognostic value. When tumor cells enter the blood vessel or lymphatics, they're able to spread to distant sites in the body, such as lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are small tan encapsulated structures that are composed of lymphocytes and play a main role in the transportation of body fluids and in the body's immune system. Here, a large lymph node with a white cut surface is seen. This lymph node has been entirely replaced by cancer. Note the size difference between the lymphocytes on the left and breast cancer cells on the right. A sentinel lymph node biopsy is a procedure when a single lymph node is sampled for tumor. The results of this test may determine if a complete lymph node dissection is necessary. Breast cancer can also spread or metastasize to other organs such as lungs or bones. However, any organ can be affected, including the brain. The spread of cancer is often assessed using imaging techniques. Well-known risk factors associated with breast cancer include female gender, old age, having dense breasts, smoking, and alcohol use.
Other risk factors associated with breast cancer include having many menstrual periods, radiation therapy to the chest, the use of birth control pills, and the use of combined hormone replacement therapy after menopause. 5 to 10% of breast cancer is hereditary, and the BRCA mutations are the most common cause. BRCA1 and 2 are normal genes which inhibit the growth of cancers. However, when these genes are mutated, the risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer may dramatically increase. BRCA1 mutations are associated with a 55 to 65% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. And BRCA2 mutation is associated with about a 45% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. BRCA genetic testing can be done in women who have a strong family history of certain types of cancer. And younger women with triple negative breast cancer should have their family history more thoroughly evaluated for any cancers that could have occurred that could suggest a BRCA mutation occurring in the family. If you have a family member or family members with any of these things listed here, you could benefit from BRCA mutation testing. Individuals with certain BRCA mutations and others at high risk for breast cancer may undergo aggressive screening for breast cancer or take medications to reduce the risk that cancer develops in the future, known as chemoprevention. Prophylactic surgeries involve removing an organ from a high-risk patient before a disease occurs in that organ. The option to have a prophylactic mastectomy may be offered to patients who have a BRCA mutation, a strong family history of cancer, lobular carcinoma in situ, or breast cancer diagnosed in one breast and then having the other removed prophylactically. A prophylactic oophorectomy involves removal of the ovaries which naturally produce estrogen, a potential breast cancer promoting agent. In addition, BRCA mutations increase the risk of ovarian cancer. You may have heard about the actress Angelina Jolie who had a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy and prophylactic bilateral salpingo oophorectomy due to having a BRCA1 mutation. The following lesions, such as usual ductal hyperplasia, may be identified in a breast and will mildly increase the risk of developing cancer. Atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia are lesions which resemble but do not meet the criteria for ductal carcinoma in situ or lobular carcinoma in situ, and they moderately increase the risk of developing breast cancer. Lobular carcinoma in situ is a strong risk factor for the development of breast cancer. Interestingly, LCIS itself does not progress into breast cancer. In LCIS, the lobular architecture is preserved. However, all the acini are expanded by monotonous cells which have obliterated the lumens. LCIS is negative for e-cadherin. Breast cancer may be managed with surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and targeted therapy. We'll briefly discuss how the use of hormone and targeted therapy is determined. To determine which factors promote breast cancer cell growth, three ancillary studies are performed on breast cancer cells. Estrogen and progesterone receptor testing is performed to determine if estrogen and progesterone is promoting cancer cell growth. In this case, the nuclei are brown, meaning that estrogen and progesterone receptors are present. HER2 or HER2 nu is often performed as a molecular test to determine if the gene is amplified. If estrogen or progesterone receptors are present, then hormone therapy can be given. If HER2 is amplified, then targeted therapy is given. Triple negative cancers do not have estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, or HER2 nu amplification and have a poor prognosis. Hormone therapy medications seen on the left side of the screen here may be given when breast cancer has either estrogen or progesterone receptors. Targeted therapies seen on the right side of the screen may be given when breast cancer has amplification of HER2. New adjuvant therapy is administered before surgery to shrink the size of the cancer. Adjuvant therapy is given after surgery to prevent it from recurring. Molecular tests are the latest tool used to predict the behavior of invasive and in situ breast lesions. These tests help determine the appropriate treatment for each individual. After being treated for breast cancer, it is important to get the proper social and emotional support, as well as attend follow-up appointments. Breast forms and reconstruction are additional options. Although breast cancer is a terrible disease, it's nice to know that the five-year survival rate is about 89% in the United States. Aside from skin cancer, breast cancer is the most common cause of cancer in women in the United States, and the second most common cause of cancer deaths. The burden of this disease can be lessened by monitoring your breasts, reporting abnormal findings, undergoing clinical breast exams, and screening mammograms. Discussing your family history with your physician is also important for assessing your risk of having a BRCA mutation. In addition, being physically active and avoiding alcohol and cigarettes will reduce the risk of breast cancer. Having children at a young age and long-term breastfeeding will also reduce your risk. Feel free to share the link to this video to bring more awareness of breast cancer. See the video description for more resources and speak to your doctor with any individual questions about your breast health.